So I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, and I want to thank the Climate Change Coalition for hosting me, Crossroads for, for putting us up in this beautiful building, and also DCMC for, um, for sponsoring this event. Um, I appreciate you bringing people together to talk about this important topic. Um, so um, just to start, um, I don't have any financial disclosures. Um, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest on this issue. Um, these are my two kids, Finn, who is almost four, and Juniper, who is one and a half. They're somewhere out there right now being watched by, by my parents, uh, thankfully. So, um, you know, I work on climate change because I want to have a world that they can thrive in. And I want other people's kids to have that too. And at the end of the day, I want people to be healthy and happy. Um, and climate change is a threat to that, but addressing climate change is also an opportunity to create the kind of world that we want them to live in. So what we're gonna do today is um, just first do a brief review of climate, uh, the health impacts of climate change and the health opportunities of the clean energy transition we're gonna take kind of zoom out and look at like where we are right now in terms of emissions, where we were and where we need to go. And we're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about the unique role for health professionals in the healthcare sector. And then talk a bit about how you can decide how to get involved. Um, and then go from there to talk about how to connect with other people doing this work. Uh, for the people who aren't health professionals in, in this audience, I'm hoping that this talk will be helpful for you to gain ways to improve how you talk about climate change um, to decision makers because health has consistently been shown to be one of the best messages. Um, the key takeaways uh, when we sort of factor in health on climate change are that there's an overwhelming consensus, scientific consensus that climate change is caused by humans burning fossil fuels. It's bad for our health. It'll get worse without action. Transitioning from fossil fuels to clean energy will make our communities healthier, more just, and more prosperous, that society will inevitably transition away from fossil fuels, but only policy and collective decision-making can ensure that it happens quickly enough to avoid catastrophic impacts and that the benefits of that transition are fairly distributed. Lastly, health professionals play a critical role in driving that transition fast enough and driving it towards health and equity. It is mainstream medicine now to say that climate change is the major public health threat of the 21st century. The National Academy of Medicine has said it, the New England Journal of Medicine, along with 200 other leading medical journals have said it and called for action. So this is standard in our field. In terms of how health impacts climate change, it's vast and complex, but it really comes down to rising temperatures, more extreme weather, rising sea levels primarily, and these are eroding the foundations upon which our health uh, rests. Uh, most of the sort of health gains that human society has made in the last couple hundred years have come through scientific advances and environmental advances that have required a stable civilization. Uh, and we've been able to sort of minimize our disease exposure, but climate change is threatening a lot of those things. First, uh, warmer air holds more air pollution and allergens. You we're gonna see worse asthma, allergies, cardiovascular and respiratory disease. At the same time, extreme heat like we're seeing in the US right now, and especially Europe is suffering from, uh, can cause heat related illness and death, but also many, many more deaths from a variety of diseases, including cardiovascular disease. Um, and these, these are not small numbers. Um, you can see thousands of people die in some of these single event heat waves like uh, we're experiencing right now. Same time, we're seeing drought that's not only impacting our food supplies, drinking water, but also in places like the Southwest is worsening certain dust borne uh, diseases like valley fever. Um, we're also obviously seeing wildfire and even starting to experience that in Wisconsin coming down from um, you know, upper Minnesota, but also drifting all the way across the country. And, the pollution in that wildfire smoke is just so, so damaging to human health. It's just extremely toxic. Um, at the same time, uh, we're seeing worsened vector-borne diseases, which means diseases that are carried by animals or insects. Uh, the one that a lot of people are worried about is Lyme disease spreading uh, in its distribution, but also 
in terms of its sort of uh, intensity within that within that distribution, but also seeing West Nile virus, uh, malaria, other forms of encephalitis, some sort of tropical diseases migrating up uh, into sort of Florida and the southern U.S. Um, we're also seeing flooding, so severe sort of river flooding in the inland parts of the U.S., but also coastal flooding, uh, which can cause trauma, displacement, um, obviously deaths from drowning, but also after it goes away, you can see worsened asthma from mold, um, loss of homes, um, and then that can also contaminate water supplies. So even heavy rainfall events have been shown to contaminate both rural drinking wells and um, urban uh, drinking water systems. So you see an increase, for example, in kids going to the emergency room for diarrhea, diarrheal illnesses after heavy rainfall events. And that was actually a study done in central Wisconsin in sort of the Marshfield footprint. Um, but perhaps the most concerning impact that climate change is gonna have on health is these sort of fundamental things that determine how stable societies are and where they can live. Do you have habitat that doesn't flood? Do you, are you able to produce enough food? food? Are you able to go outside, to the, outside and have it be less than 130 degrees? Uh, and um, that's pretend, what we're looking at is some scenarios, worst case scenarios where potentially hundreds of millions of people have to move by the end of the century uh, because of famine, because of loss of habitat, because of, and that potentially producing conflict and also worsening, worsening emerging diseases where you have large populations who are um, uh, sort of malnourished traveling, but also produ potentially producing conflict. Those are sort of the nightmare scenarios that like is part of what keeps me working on this. Um, and it's also a justice issue because those people who are gonna have to move have done the least to create this problem. Uh, and that's simply put, not fair. The flip side to all this is while climate change is gonna be, depending on how bad it get, gets, is gonna be devastating to human health. At the same time, the activities that are causing climate change are making us sick. Specifically, it's important whenever you talk about this to name the cause, which is the burning of fossil fuels. The burning of fossil fuels is making our patients sick, mostly through air pollution across the entire spectrum of their lives. Just one of the pollutants in particular, particulate matter that's less than 2.5 microns, is small enough that when people breathe it in, it goes to the smallest parts of their lung and crosses it into the bloodstream and can go essentially anywhere in their body, including their brains. It can cross the placenta and impact embryos and fetuses. So across the entire spectrum of, of their lives, from the moment of conception to their last breath, our patients are made sick because we get our energy from fossil fuels. Burning fossil fuels causes premature births, stillbirths, still births, delayed cognitive development in children, asthma, heart attacks, strokes, cancer, and dementia. Nationwide, this causes at least 100,000 early deaths from fossil fuel air pollution each year, and that's probably a significant underestimate. That number is probably 1,900 in Wisconsin each year. Nationwide, there's about $800 billion a year in damages from direct health costs and decreased productivity about $21 billion a year in Wisconsin. It's important to point out that that burden falls disproportionately on the poor and the people of color, again, who are using less energy and the ones who are least contributing to this problem. But this is also a major opportunity for Wisconsin. The treatment is not a bitter pill. The right energy policies can simultaneously make our communities healthier, wealthier, decrease health disparities and slow climate change. As I said, if we decarbonize, we can save probably more than 100,000 lives a year in the US, 1,900 lives a year in Wisconsin. That means less kids going into the emergency room with asthma attacks, less heart attacks, less co delayed cognitive development in children, less preterm births, less stillbirths. Also, the financial savings of those health benefits from carbon reductions are much larger than the actual cost of making that transition. As I said, nationwide, we would save about $800 billion a year. That's $800 billion a year that we're saving for decades. That is essentially our entire defense budget. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the most aggressive plans that were proposed, like Bernie Sanders' $6.5 trillion Build Back Better, was about $300 billion a year sustained for 10 years. 
Uh, the climate spending, which unfortunately recently just got tanked, was $50 billion a year, and it would have gotten us a lot of the way there. So, you know, that's almost an order of magnitude difference, depending on like which policies you're talking about. Uh, specifically, it's important to benefit or to point out that this transition will benefit Wisconsin, rural Wisconsinites. Wisconsin has no in-state fossil fuel sources. We ship out $14 billion a year of our state money to buy energy from elsewhere. If we trans transition to clean electrification to an economy powered one by 100% renewable energy in Wisconsin, it would add 162,000 jobs, which by the way, there are already more jobs in renewables than in fossil fuels in Wisconsin. But in particular, this is a rural opportunity because rural areas can produce the energy that cities need and cities will pay for. In fact, rural solar revenue, this is a nationwide stat, rural solar revenue will meet and then exceed corn, soy, or cattle production by 2030. And this has a huge benefit for um, rural townships. I see this where I live, where rural townships are having a hard time keeping their roads maintained, keeping their schools open. The property tax benefits from, uh, re rural, from rural, renewable energy can have a huge boost to, to some of these rural townships and help them keep their, their roads maintained and their schools open. Um, it's also important to note that clean energy is extremely popular regardless of political leaning. Um, and I think this is a major alignment of rural and urban interests. Um, you know, we came up through Algoma on the way up here and I was thinking about the fights that you hear a lot um, about sort of whether, whether some of the cities along Lake Michigan are in attainment of their EPA air standards or not. I don't know if many of you follow that. And I think people are sort of thinking about this problem wrong. They're thinking like, should we be on the hook for what Chicago and Milwaukee are producing in terms of pollution? But that to me is the wrong way to think about it. The way to think about it is rural Wisconsin and the entire Lake Michigan coast of Wisconsin has a vested interest in Milwaukee and Chicago transitioning to mass transit and electrified transit and renewable energy. And if some of that energy can be produced up here in Northeast Wisconsin to power that, then this area benefits economically and our air is cleaner. Those cities benefit because their air is cleaner too. And I think this is, climate change is an issue on which I would argue we have some of the most aligned interest between rural and urban areas uh, in this country. And I think that's something that's critically important because that's increasingly a sort of damaging divide we have in our society. To transition a little bit here, um, the base, I think it's important to talk about the basic science of warming, which most of you are probably familiar with, but just some terms that are important to, to understand. Net emissions means you're emitting more greenhouse gases than you are absorbing. Any positive net emissions means you're having warming. So only net zero stops warming. You only stop making the problem worse when you get to net zero. So when we talk about reaching net zero at 2050, what we're saying is that is the point at which we stop making this problem worse. Uh, it's just important to keep that in the back of your mind. We've already warmed about a degree Celsius. 1.5 degrees Celsius is sort of considered an inflection point for some of the critical life supporting ecosystems. Unfortunately, it's looking increasingly difficult to stay under that, particularly with current policies, but we'll touch on that in a second. We are probably gonna burn through our, our sort of carbon budget to standard 1.5 in the next seven to eight years unless really dramatic policy changes are made. But it's important to point out that the harmful effects of climate change are nonlinear and that the warming is nonlinear. The further you go up, the faster the warming happens per amount of greenhouse gases, which is, um, so, uh, the other thing that I want to sort of tep, step back and touch on is to point out that we have made some progress, but just kind of put us in the map of where we are in terms of possible scenarios. And we're in a lot better place than we were 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, I think that's around the last time I was here giving a talk, we were looking at realistic scenarios of four to five degrees Celsius, which uh, were, I think you could say seriously, um, it would not be unreasonable to consider that sort of a human extinction event with that level of warming. Uh, there were hundreds of coal plants proposed in the US alone. Most of those coal plants didn't get built. Uh, and a big part of that is because there was a lot of advocacy, but also the price of solar and other key technologies has dropped 90% in the last 10 years. And um, 
that's in part because of good policy. Uh, the tech is advancing rapidly, getting rapidly cheaper, and we have the technologies we need to get about 80% of this transition done. So we've avoided the worst warming policies, but our current, the po current policies sort of globally that the countries have enacted probably get us somewhere around 2.7 degrees Celsius, which is still way too high. Uh, and like I said, we wanna shoot for 1.5 degrees Celsius, but every 10th of a degree matters. Every 10th of a degree determines whether millions of people are gonna to have to move. So I think it's really important in working on climate change to not view this as a binary issue where you either sort of win at 1.5 degrees or give up. We have to fight for every little bit. Um, right now, national pledges globally will get us to probably two degrees Celsius, but these are only pledges that aren't backed up by policy. Uh, and we need policy at all levels. We not only need governments to enact policies, but we need major institutions like healthcare driving these changes. And how well we do at all this determines sort of these, the balance between these three things, how much you prevent, meaning you slow climate change by decarbonizing, how much you prepare to the inevitable, for the inevitable climate change that's gonna come and how much we suffer. Those are the three points uh, that we are sort of determining. The balance is yet to be decided. The balance of them is up to us and the justice of it is up to us. While the transition to clean energy is inevitable, as I said, because those technologies are better and cheaper, whether it happens fast enough and in a just way will determine how much we prevent and prepare versus how much we suffer. And health professionals have a key role in determining this. You, health professionals can make a difference. You're highly trusted. Health professionals are consistently ranked amongst the most trusted um, voices in society. Um, the health message has consistently been shown, and this is relevant for everybody, um, health professionals or not, the health message has consistently been shown to be one of the most effective messages to uh, promote climate action. Health professionals have unique skills. You have key science understanding and communication skills. You have the, we're all, our basic fundamental role is to take the science of people's bodies and help them understand it in a way that allows them to take agency over their life and be healthy. And that's what's needed on a societal level right now. It's also important health professionals are willing to consider bad scenarios and act to prevent them and communicate to people about them, which is critical with climate change. Health professionals also have access to decision makers. It's easier for us to get meetings with elected officials but also we are in some of the most powerful institutions in society and we have uh, voices within those institutions. But the most important thing about health professionals is that we are in this because we care. And the powers that we're fighting against don't care about people. And that is, may seem like a overstatement, but that's what I believe because it's backed up by the choices that they've made over the last 40 to 50 years since they've learned about the existence of climate change. But health professionals care about people, and that is the core, our core motivating uh, driver is that we care about people. Um, and so um, that makes us really important in this challenge. But I'm also here to say that if you decide to get involved in this, you'll be glad you did. Uh, I think it's important to talk about burnout. You hear about it a lot, but I think a lot of times people sort of misunderstand it. They, you know, especially sort of people talk about it as if you're just sort of overworked and tired and that's definitely part of it. But I think in particular in sort of a values driven uh, um, career like healthcare, where we got into this because we wanted to help people, but at the same time, we sort of are working in a society that isn't really designed for people to be healthy and in a health, larger health system, American health system that frankly is, fairly broken uh, and that produces moral injury. Uh, you, you spend all day trying to help people and you feel like you're limited in your ability to do that. Um, for me, the way I deal with that is that I go home at night and I try to make that, that society more conducive to people being healthier because I want my patients to be healthy. The patients that I see in clinic, I try and help them be physically active uh, and then I go home and try and have our communities designed in a way in which it's actually possible for them to be physically active. Um, 
you're going to need to overcome some barriers if you are going to work on this. Uh, one of the biggest ones for health professionals is that we all want to feel expert. Uh, we don't like talking about things unless we feel extremely well sort of versed in it. Uh, and that is totally appropriate in healthcare, but we don't need more experts on climate change. The reasons for acting are very basic and apparent to most people. What we need is more people with voices using them. The second thing that's a barrier for people is that new things are intimidating. Meeting with an elected official, forming a green team at your health system or your workplace, trying to get people together and achieve a goal. All these things are intimidating, but you'll find if you do these things that just doing them once for the first time, it's no different than any other meeting. All of this work is mostly just a bunch of meetings, which, sorry, I'm probably actually just made that really unappealing, but uh, <laughs> let's just scratch that one from the next talk. But point is, it shouldn't be intimidating. Um, but the biggest barrier is that people want to avoid controversy, avoiding perceived controversy. A lot of people are uncomfortable talking about climate change because they think it's controversial. And it's important to point out that this perception of controversy is an intentional tactic of the fossil fuel industry. It's been a well-funded misinformation campaign that has been going on for at least 40 years. And what this has produced is a situation where the people who are the most dismissive of the science are the loudest. But if you look at the polling here, you'll see that that's about 9% of the population and shrinking. More than 50% of the population is either concerned or alarmed, and that alarm subsegment is growing really rapidly. In fact, it grew by over 50% in the last four years. But there's this phenomena of social proof whereby we sort of judge how common something is by what, what we hear around us. And the problem is if we all think climate change is controversial and we don't talk about it, and the only person talking is this person who's dismissive and getting really bad information, if they're the only one talking, then everybody's gonna think that that is the most common perception. So that one of the most important things you can do about climate change is just talk about it with your loved ones, with your friends, with your coworkers. So, so that brings me to a question. Um, who in here, health professional or not, had to have a conversation with somebody where you recommended a vaccine and, for COVID and they didn't wanna hear about it? And did you talk about it anyway? Why? It's good for them. Yeah, right? And, we know it is. and it's true and we know it is. Yeah. So as health professionals, we know climate change is a threat. We know acting on climate change is a major opportunity to improve the health and justice of our communities. It doesn't matter if it's controversial. I, in fact, you'll find that it's not controversial, but even if it were, you should talk about it anyway because it's the right thing to do and because it's what our communities need. I think it's important in moments like this to sort of, when you're facing sort of these challenges, whether it's being nervous about doing something new, being nervous about offending somebody by talking about climate change um, or feeling like you're not expert enough to go back to this question of why are you doing this? And remembering what's at stake. I struggle with those same barriers, but like I said, it's important for me to remember what's at stake. I became a rural family doctor to help people who are struggling to be able to live the lives they hope for. I'm here this afternoon because I see my patients struggling every day, and there's only so much I can do to help them from my exam room. No matter what part of Wisconsin people come from or where they get their news, they all want and deserve some basic things. They want to earn a good living from their work. They want to be able to put food on the table and get home in time to eat it. They want to be able to afford basic goods like energy and food without it blowing a hole in their budget. They want to be healthy. They want a safe place to call home, to not wake up to devastating floods in their communities or to the news of fossil funded dictators invading their neighbors. Our patients want and deserve a future that feels bigger than their past. They deserve a future in which they can thrive and not just survive. I'm here because if we get this moment right, if we clean our air by shifting from fossil fuels to clean energy, we will achieve immediate, profound, and local health benefits. Our patients will breathe easier and have a better future to look forward to. It bears saying again, from the moment of conception to their last breath, Wisconsinites are made sicker because we get our energy from fossil fuels. At least 100,000 Americans die every year from fossil fuel pollution, 
and that may be a significant underestimate. Fossil air pollution costs America at least $820 billion a year in healthcare costs and decreased productivity. That is a staggering price to pay. But we don't have to pay that price anymore. The blueprint for something better is simple. Electrify everything we can and produce that electricity with clean energy. Producing that electricity in state would save nearly 2,000 lives every year. The transition to clean energy, as I said, is an opportunity for all Wisconsinites. Rather than paying to ship in oil, coal, and fossil gas, we can power our economy on electricity produced in rural Wisconsin. And this is a major opportunity to create rural jobs and boost township revenue, as I said, that will keep schools open and roads repaired while we pay less for energy. Meanwhile, Wisconsin cities will see cleaner air, cleaner water, and good paying jobs for making our buildings healthier, more comfortable, and cheaper to run. This is a win-win for all of Wisconsin. But for too long, fossil fuel executives have stood in the way of this opportunity, keeping us stuck using dirty, expensive fossil fuels that destabilize the world, all for their personal profit. They tried to delay this transition just a little bit longer by hiding crucial information, spreading doubt about the problem, and peddling solutions they know don't work. Not only does that delay miss the opportunity to make our patients healthier and more financially stable, that delay risks profound human suffering due to climate change. But a clean energy future is ours for the taking and we won't be tricked into silence. The good news is that thousands of health professionals like you made stronger by enduring the pandemic are learning about what's at stake, speaking up and connecting with each other to protect their patients. So what can you do? I think these things broadly fit under three categories, learning, speaking, and connecting. So learning, it's important to find your purpose in this. To gather basic information, um, you know, you can go to the National Climate Assessments chapter on human health, which is a great resource to become, gain a sort of basic competency in climate change and health. And I really recommend everybody look at this. Um, UW Health, Global Health Institute, along with our group, WHPCA, uh, we put out a medical alert that specifically looks at the health impacts of climate change in Wisconsin. Uh, other sources, the Lancet Countdown uh, is really helpful. But once you've learned, it's important to speak, to find your voice, talk to colleagues, staff, friends, family member. Like I said, one of the most important things you can do is just to talk about climate change. And you don't have to be an expert in it. The most important thing you can say is, I'm concerned about climate change. I want to have a world in which everybody can be healthy and thrive. And I think climate change threatens that. And I am considering what I need to do about it because that is the core value, which is going to unite you with the people around you who want to work on this. Um, but it's also important to speak to, to public leaders, decision makers, whether they're elected officials, whether um, they're leaders at your places of work or worship. But it's also important to connect and find your people. So uh, there are many, many great uh, climate organizations to get involved with, including the Climate Change Coalition of Door County. If you're a health professional and want to work on this, Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action, I think, is a great place to work on it. Um, and this is what we're doing. We're sort of trying to turn the gears to get movement happening um, between the public, policymakers, and health systems. So the sort of broad categories in which you can help as a health professional are to care for patients, meaning, you know, understand the health impacts of climate change and be cognizant of them when you're taking care of people. Uh, but some people are sort of more temperamentally geared towards uh, generating data. So uh, if you, if research is your thing, there is still data that needs to be produced. So you can do that. Um, but also helping the health sector do its part. We'll touch on this quite a bit in a second, but climate smart healthcare. Um, helping your community learn, giving presentations, making sure your media is talking about climate change in an accurate way, in particular, um, calling it a human problem, uh, in particular, naming the cause, the burning of fossil fuels, which are two things that media is really bad at. They uh, tend to blame climate change on climate change. Climate change isn't caused by climate change. Climate change is a result of burning fossil fuels by humans. Um, it's also um, important to help your community decide to prevent and prepare, to engage uh, with your community at any level that feels right to you. Um, so in, um, in terms of 
uh, in particular, uh, one of the things that you can do, well, actually, we'll just move on. So, Climate Smart Healthcare, um, why should we do it? Um, the healthcare sector is very energy intensive. The healthcare sector in the US is responsible for about 8% of US carbon emissions. So we have a big responsibility to fix our part of this problem. But by acting on climate change, healthcare institutions can truly become anchor institutions. And first, those of you who aren't sort of, don't sit in meetings with healthcare administrators, what people mean by that is an anchor institution is sort of a, an institution, a community that's really important and seeks to benefit that larger community. And a lot of health systems really want to do that. And I would argue climate smart healthcare is one of the best ways they can do that because they can make their communities healthier. They can boost their local economy. Meanwhile, improving their bottom line and frankly, getting good PR in the process. Uh, it's an opportunity to be a visible leader in the community. Health systems are often amongst the largest employers in a community, but also health systems um, decarbonizing is an opportunity for people to interact in a positive way with an example of clean energy. So specifically, there are three key parts to climate smart healthcare. First is the decreasing emissions, decarbonizing, electrifying where you can, transitioning to renewable energy where you can, making use of uh, renewable energy. So transitioning your operations and procurement to efficiency, clean energy, and sustainability in all three scopes. So the energy you're burning on site, the energy you're using on site that's produced elsewhere, and then also the goods that you're procuring, uh, which is actually sort of the biggest part of healthcare emissions is the scope three piece. Um, the, so we have the decarbonization, we have developing resilience to extreme weather, so adaptation. It's important for health systems to still be able to function in the face of extreme weather events. This is critically important and it's essential that health systems think about this and prepare for it. But the third piece, which is often overlooked, is the importance of partnering with a community to help them decarbonize and adapt in a way that protects health. And that community can be defined local, state, or federal. And partnering can mean supporting policy. And this can be done. Wisconsin has many, many uh, of the sort of the leading health systems in the country and the world on this. And so we have some great examples we can learn from. So Gunderson Health, for example, in 2008, they spent $2 billion or $2 million on conservation and they got a 60% return on their investment, which is just an incredible amount. And that was mostly because of energy efficiency, essentially. Um, in 2014, they achieved net zero for their scope one and two emissions. Um, there are lots of other health systems who are making big progress and these aren't uh, all urban. Uh, so Spirus, uh, 80, they're committed to 80% emissions reductions uh, by 2030. Advocate Aurora Health uh, is committed to 100% renewables by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Um, there are health systems in Wisconsin who are doing an amazing job of partnering with their communities. Um, outside Wisconsin, Providence Health in Oregon is sort of done the things that are listed above, but also is a great leader in terms of engaging on policy in a way that's uh, really innovative. And so that's a great example to look to. It's also important to point out that this is just where things are headed in healthcare. Just like the general economy, healthcare is gonna transition away from fossil fuels. The National Academy of Medicine is urging this transition. The American Hospital Association is acknowledging that this transition is inevitable, but policy may soon require it and competitors are doing it. So it's important not to get caught flat-footed. So going beyond climate smart healthcare, as I mentioned, helping your community learn, giving presentations, uh, making sure your local media talks about climate in an accurate way, but also making sure healthcare professional schools teach climate and health. Again, going beyond healthcare, like I said, helping your community prevent and prepare. A great example and a great way to get involved on a local level is electric school buses. So we send kids to school to learn. We often send them there on diesel buses where they are breathing known unsafe levels of air pollution that we know delay their cognitive development in learning. Meanwhile, electric buses exist, which are have lower lifetime operating costs because they have much lower fuel and maintenance costs. We could be sending our kids to school on these buses and the thing that's gonna decide whether we do it is whether people like you show up at school board meetings and turn the conversation towards this productive, constructive one in which we can all agree. Um, but also you can get engaged in city clean energy plans and adaptation plans. On a state level, you can get involved, for example, with the Public Service Commission, uh, supporting clean energy and avoiding fossil fuels. 
you can connect with your legislators to push uh, because legislators need health professionals from their communities to be talking to them about this issue. You can engage federally. The EPA rulemaking relies heavily on health professionals, um, but also federal legislators rely on local health professionals. So we talked a lot about, uh, you know, climate change is an issue that we need to address. Society is going to benefit if we decide to address it. Uh, that health professional that we can um, uh, that we can address it, um, and that health profession that the let me back up. I think I skipped a slide before uh, an important one, which is what can we what can we do about this technologically? So I'm just gonna this is gonna be a little disjointed, but this is a really important point. Do we have the technology to do what we need to on climate change? So we're gonna sort of rewind a little bit here. Um, we have uh the five key technologies essentially that we need to get 80 percent of the way there which is renewables primarily solar and wind electric batteries and um heat pumps so heat pumps meaning electric heating and cooling for buildings is going to essentially where most building heating and cooling is going to go and so essentially and then electric cars so transitioning everything because we can we know how to produce cheap renewable electricity. We transition everything we can over to the electric kit, and then we power that with renewable electricity. And that essentially gets us 80% of the way there. And not only that, it saves, uh, if we did that and transition 80% of the grid to clean electrification by 2030, the average family would save about $1,000 a year in energy costs. Not only that, uh, modeling has shown that um, we can do that without any sacrifice and reliability. And in fact, in many cases, an improvement in reliability. Um, so the sort of remaining 20% of those emissions reductions, those technologies are being developed, but we have what we need and we essentially need to rapidly build out and replace uh, sort of what we're doing now with, with these new technologies. So it's important to point out, not only should we act on this, but, we have the tools that we need to right now. We just need to get society to pick these tools up and use them. And as I said, because these tools are better, because they're cheaper, they're going to get used anyway. But the question is, do we use it, use them fast enough? And do we use policy to drive that change fast enough in a just direction? As I said, health professionals play a key role in this. Um, so the question is, what should you do? And to this, I turn to Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, who's a marine biologist. Um, and she has a great uh, podcast called How to Save a Planet uh, that I really recommend. And she has this Venn diagram, which I think is really helpful, which is what brings you joy? What are you good at? And what is the work that needs doing? Somewhere in the middle of those is what you should do. So here's what I've chosen to do, which is to work together with other health professionals on climate change. Um, so Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action is a nonprofit 501c3, nonpartisan. We empower health professionals to advocate for equitable solutions to the climate crisis. We have an education and clinical integration work group, and we educate ourselves, our colleagues, the patients, and the public. A lot of this is sort of what I just talked about. We produce clinical resources. We put on annual conferences. We have a speakers bureau for when people, we train people to give these presentations. So when somebody requests the talk, they can hopefully have somebody from their local community come do it. We improve health professional schools, climate health curricula. We improve local reporting on climate and health. Climate smart healthcare. Uh, we help health systems decrease emissions, prepare for climate change and partner with their communities toward those goals. We diffuse the innovation that's already happening in Wisconsin throughout the state, in part by supporting the formation of green teams at health systems around the state. So if anybody here is interested in doing that at uh, DCMC, definitely talk to me after. Um, we also engage with decision makers to ensure that policy supports the healthcare sector in this transition. Climate justice, um, we center justice and equity in our work and try to create space for and empower frontline communities to advocate for climate health equity. A great and a really exciting project that we're working on is mapping flooding health vulnerability in Milwaukee to develop a plan with the city to ensure that frontline communities voices are heard and that they have equitable investments in their communities to protect the most vulnerable. Policy and advocacy, we engage, we empower health professionals um, and their institutions statewide to advance local, state, 
uh, and federal climate policy. We were really involved with the governor's task force on climate change. Um, climate change is um, mentioned in over 40% of the pages in that report and it was central to the recommendations. And that was because of uh, the involvement of about 30 health professionals in that process. We engage regularly with the Public Service Commission because they rely on expert opinion. This is a really high yield opportunity. But we also educate local, state, and federal lawmakers. Again, we are 501c3, we don't lobby, but we educate elected officials and decision makers on these issues. So uh, how to get involved with our group. Um, if you wanna dip your toe in, uh, we have a policy and advocacy meeting Monday night on Zoom at 7.30. Uh, if you give me your email, I could um, uh, let you know about that. But if you wanna sign up for alerts, um, I, you can go to wiclimatehealth.org slash join. So I wanna end again, um, going a little bit deeper on why I'm here. Uh, so I grew up down in Green Bay um, in uh, just be, sort of by the Mason and Ashland intersection, if anybody knows it, Tank Park. Um, and it's a neighborhood with a lot of Southeast Asian immigrants. And um, lately I've been thinking about a friend of mine from elementary school. He was a Hmong Vietnam War refugee. He had a stutter and his wheel he was wheelchair bound because he'd had one of his legs badly injured by playing by the train track under the Ashland Bridge and ultimately had it amputated. All this made him the frequent, frequent target of bullying. One morning when I was eight, I showed up to the playground before school and found him crying in his wheelchair. My friend's eyes downcast, he fidgeted with his, with his prosthetic leg as he stuttered, struggling to tell me that when learning to walk with it that morning, one of the bullies had made fun of him. I was so angry for him. He didn't deserve this. No one did. I had often been the subject of unfair anger from people more powerful than me and learned to be silent because of it. But I'd also spent many Sundays and Wednesdays in church being toss, taught that we must choose to help those who are suffering. Hearing the parable of the Good Samaritan, I always wondered whether I would help if I were faced with that challenge. On the playground that morning, I looked to the teacher who stood doing nothing. I could see I needed to step up to raise my voice and help my friend. So I did. I walked up to the bully and confronted him. And from that day on, the bullies left my friend alone. And you know what? He learned to run on his prosthetic leg with more fierce joy than any of us. And from that moment, I decided I'd always be a person who spoke up. When I grew up, I became a doctor so I could help people who needed it, like the people I'd grown up alongside in my neighborhood. I love being in healthcare, working alongside people like you and taking care of the rest of you in this audience. Health professionals show up to work every day because you want the people in your communities to be healthy and happy, to be free of suffering. We have spent the last two years enduring this terrible pandemic and the burden has been awful. We have had to deal with the fear of the unknown, with an ever-present threat to ourselves and our families. We've had to deal with people who don't believe us or even think we're lying about the problem. Most of all, we have had to watch profound human suffering. Some of our colleagues understandably had to walk away and do something else, but you and I endured. We kept coming to work, doing our part to help people because this isn't just a job. This is who we are. I keep asking myself, what if we had known this pandemic were coming? What could we have done to prevent and prepare so we could avoid suffering? If our leaders had known with certainty that this pandemic was coming five years ago, what could they have done? It could have been contained and resolved. I keep asking myself, what would I have done had I known five, 10 years ago that this pandemic were coming? Would I have raised my voice and demanded that our leaders prepare? Of course, we had no way to know when and how this pandemic would hit. But the threat of climate change but we know with certainty that climate change is not only coming, that it is here, that we are causing it by burning fossil fuels, and that it could get catastrophically worse for human health if we keep burning fossil fuels. We also know we have the solutions we need to stop this problem, and that doing so will make our communities healthier and wealthier. The question is, who among us will speak up so we as a society make the right choice? The threat of climate change became real for me on August 27th, 2018. That's the night my first child, Finn, was born. 
on a day that Wisconsin, if you recall, was hit by an unprecedented storm causing widespread suffering. I held Finn, who's playing outside right now, uh, so fragile, while two inches on the other side of glass, a furious storm raged, the likes of which I had never seen. I looked between the whipping treetops and my son's eyes, and all I could think about was how I could make a world with climate change safe for him. I wondered how I could make it safe for other children being born that night who might not have a home to return to, like many of my patients flooded out of their homes in the Kickapoo River Valley. Just like when I was a child seeing my friend bully, bullied, I could see again I needed to raise my voice for my community. But the fossil fuel is bigger than any single bully. I could see I couldn't do this alone and I needed others to find their voices too. So I've been speaking up and finding inviting others to do the same. I've chosen to confront those who have the power to build a better world. And in so doing, I have found countless people like you, nurses, therapists, doctors, pharmacists, lay people, all willing to step outside their comfort zone together. And slowly but surely, we are making a difference. We are bending a curve. So I ask you this, will you join us? Will you start to learn? Will you raise your voice even though you're not exactly sure what to say yet? Will you connect with others to protect your community? Please sign up for WHPCA at wiclimatehealth.org slash join to sign up for alerts. With that, I'll stop. Thank you.